top cop who put his badge on the line for justice. You know the name Doug Papa? Yes, I do. God bless Doug Papa, an honest cop. I was elated, of course. But then as he testified, I was, I was somewhat concerned for him because I knew that they were probably going to crucify that man. Sometimes the truth has a price. That may be the lesson of a Virginia police officer who says, in trying to do the right thing, he ended up paying for it. The message just sent it is, see, we did it, Doug. You don't come out, you don't buck the system. Uh, no matter what the reason is, you just can basically keep your mouth shut. But if I wouldn't do it all over again, I would take the badge and I would leave it on somebody's desk and get out of police work. Because the day I can tell the truth because somebody's pressuring me, and the day the system doesn't want me to tell the truth because somebody's pressuring me, is the day I'd leave the badge on the desk and walk away. Papa was fired for insubordination. The one man who confronted truth and consequences. From Las Vegas, Nevada, this is Doug Papa, Truth and Consequences Podcast. Every time they question me, they try to um, um, prove that what I was saying was untrue, rather than take the attitude that uh, allow me to assist them in an investigation. Uh, he informed me about uh, the pad. Now, the pad, what, uh, what is a pad? Um, How do you define it? A uh, pad is... Um, a systemized um, pickup of monies from gamblers uh, in order to um, uh, give them immunity from arrest. We must create an atmosphere in which the dishonest officer fears the honest one and not the other way around. I hope that this investigation and any future ones will deal with corruption at all levels within the department and not limit themselves to cases involving individual patrolmen. I hope that police officers in the future will not experience the same frustration and anxiety that I was subjected to for the past five years at the hands of my superiors because of my attempt to report corruption. Welcome to episode 90 for Friday, February 11, 2022. On the line with me is retired legendary NYPD detective and Medal of Honor recipient Frank Serpico. In 1971, Frank Serpico was shot in the face during a drug bust in a Brooklyn tenement. He was awarded the NYPD Medal of Honor, which was handed to him over the counter like a pack of cigarettes, and the accompanying certificate was not certified. For 50 years, Frank Serpico has asked every police commissioner for a properly engraved Medal of Honor and certified certificate. On February 3rd of this year, Frank Serpico received his properly engraved Medal of Honor and accompanying certificate thanks to newly elected New York City Mayor, Eric Adams. Welcome to the show, Frank. How are you doing today? Uh, not bad for my age, Doug. Uh, thanks for having me on. No problem, Frank. Uh, I know what you feel like with uh, with age, but, you know, we're still uh, two bulldogs. We keep on going. Um, but, you know, Doug, the age doesn't bother me so much, but it's this constant battle with corruption. And, you know, people want to talk about corruption and the police, uh, corruption. But when it fights, uh, when it comes to fighting corruption in so-called whistleblowing agencies, you know, that, in my opinion, are nothing more than uh, money-making cottage industries uh, that only represent whistleblowers where they can make money. And um, that's what I'm having a problem right now. But uh, I think we want to talk about the uh, the Medal of Honor. Yes, um, you you received it uh, in the mail on February third, uh, thanks to uh, Mayor Adams from New York City. But uh, as I look through a, a lot of the media and different organizations, so, uh, uh, yeah, let, let me correct that right from the beginning, Doug, okay? Um, I've been, as you said, trying to get this for over 50 years. Right. Uh, the original medal was given to me like a pack of cigarettes in a little box, and uh, it was inscribed to patrolmen. 
instead of detective. Okay. So um, a few years back when Kelly was there, Commissioner Kelly, who was a sergeant when I exposed endemic corruption, uh, widespread corruption in the police department, he knew exactly what was going on. He was actually working for the commissioner of investigations or the um, uh, the mayor's office, uh, Jay Kriegel and um, commissioner, um, I, I want to call him Leary, but Leary was the uh, police commissioner. What the hell was the mayor's name? Uh, Lindsay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, he's not, he's playing stupid, right? But anyway, I asked him for my medal. And he says, come into my office and I'll give it to you. And I don't want any fanfare, especially if it's make believe. And I said, um, just put it in the mail, okay? Because I didn't want any phony uh, photo op. So in the mail, I get a nicely framed certificate promoting me to detective. My detective certificate was never given to me either. So he sends me my promotion to detective <laughs> and not the Medal of Honor. Also, it was to detective third grade. Now, anyone who gets the Medal of Honor is automatically given uh, detective first grade. Most of them are given out posthumously, right. unfortunately, after the officer uh, makes the ultimate sacrifice. They expected me to die, Duck. They were hoping I would die. They sent me head, hate mail in the hospital and all kinds of stuff. So I know where uh, their minds are. So I thought, okay, back with Murphy. Okay, I wait. I ask again. I ask. The last guy I asked uh, was uh, uh, Commissioner Shea, right? He doesn't respond. So uh, Larry McShane, the New York News, was going to write a story about my 50-year anniversary uh, that I testified before the NAP Commission. And I thought that he was going to take the opportunity to say that I still haven't gotten my proper certification um, and medal. So um, I'm waiting. But meanwhile, I get in touch with um, Chris Dunn of the New York Civil Liberties Union. And he writes um, to Shea or his staff, and they say, oh, okay, we'll send him the certificate. So sure enough, the certificate comes rolled up in a tube. I open it up, and uh, it doesn't have a department seal on it, right? <laughs> so it's just a piece of paper without a seal. And interestingly enough, it's signed uh, by Commissioner Murphy, 1972, right? That's when I uh, got the medal. Right. So I say, huh, did they uh, exhume him to sign this? Or uh, where the hell has this certificate been laying for over 50 years? So that's a good question. So then I say, you know what? This is another slap in the face, sending me a certificate without an official department seal. So I went down to Toyota, and uh, I got a gold seal, and I put it on my certificate. And I said, if they want to make a joke out of it, I might as well enjoy it, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I thought, you know what? This is a disgrace. All the men and women that gave their lives for this medal, and... They're making a mockery of it. Right. So I uh, uh, got in touch with Larry McShane, and he said he was going to write an article, as I said before. 
So the article comes out, and there's nothing in there about the certificate. So I go on Twitter, and I say, well, the news posted an article, but they left out that I'm still waiting for my certificate. Right. Now, I have to also say that uh, a, a retired New York City police officer and attorney, uh, Pete Gleason, who I happen to know, he wrote a letter to uh, Shea as well and said, come on, Commissioner, why don't we close this thing out you know after 50 years uh, he deserves the medal he's a hero nothing right no response so now after adams posts frank you're a hero uh you inspired me to become a police officer we're going to get you that medal so good i wait and sometimes I have my phone turned off for days. Right. But on this particular day, I turn my phone on, and there's a message from New York Civil Liberties Union. And it says, Frank, I just got a message from the mayor's office. He wants to know if you could get down here tomorrow at 8 o'clock. They'll send a car for you. And I said, uh... I didn't want to laugh, but I said, maybe I didn't hear it right. I said, what, would you repeat that? And he said, they want to know, if, can you get down here at 8 o'clock? I said, what, are you kidding me? I'm 85 years old. I live two hours upstate. I got to go down there and back. What about if I have relatives that I want to, you know, invite to this? So I said, look, just tell them to put it in the mail like I've been telling them for over 50 years. Mm -hmm. A little while later, he calls me back. Right. They give you three options. You can come down, they'll give it to you, or uh, they'll uh, send the car up to deliver it to you, or they'll put it in the mail. I said, Chris, I already told you. Didn't you tell them? Just put it in the mail. Thank you. He calls me back again. Frank, they want to know, can they drive it up to the sheriff's office upstate and he'll deliver it to you? And I didn't want to tell them the problems I've had up here with the corruption. Uh, so I said, and Doug, I'm doing the best I can to control myself because the guy's a decent guy. I I don't have anything with him. Right. But these freaking people that I've been dealing with for over 50 years and the 12 years before that, you know, how much can you take? So I said, tell them to put it in the mail. Again. Oh, they said they can't mail it. The post office won't take it. So I call up my post office and I say, is that true? They said, we'll ship anything you want. So anyway, they decided they were going to drive it to the post office. So I said to my lady, because I only go down there once a month. Mm -hmm. I said, she says, aren't you going to go pick up your certificate? And I said, no. Um, and the other thing, uh, Dunn from Civil Liberties said to me, okay, what do you want on here? And uh, I said, look, I want whatever they give any other recipient of that medal. Right. Nothing more, nothing less. He says, well, it's inscribed January 1st. 2022. So I didn't want to blow a gasket and say, what the, you know, that's not when I got the medal. Right. So in my opinion, they're trying to make it look like they gave me the medal for blowing the whistle. Right. Which, incidentally, I had said to the Daily News, they're making it look like 
I said, I would be honored to receive that uh, for all whistleblowers that expose corruption in their name. All right. But that's not what it's about. Okay, that's not going to happen. So um, my lady says to me, uh, when are you going to pick it up? And I says, I'm going to pick it up on February 3rd. And she says, why? I says, because that's when I got shot. And that's when I'll open it up and I'll present it to myself. Mm-hmm. Now, for your listening audience to clarify, First of all, not only did Commissioner Patrick V. Murphy, who is supposed to be the reform commissioner, who incidentally, his father was a cop and he was a cop uh, and his brother was a cop. And when Murphy was a cop, he got assigned to plain clothes. And way back then, he writes in his own book, he knew plain clothes was corrupt. Right. It's a known fact throughout the department. It's your biggest money-making graft besides narcotics. But, you know, cops who want to lie to themselves, they call it the meat eaters and the grass eaters. The grass eaters, they'll take money from, you know, uh, gambling, vice, and stuff. They say, oh, those people are going to do it anyway, so we might as well take the payoff. Bullshit. All that money supports the drug trade. Then you have the meat eaters that exactly that, they're bloodthirsty bastards. Okay? Mm-hmm. So now, um, the law at the time was that no one was going to get promoted to detective unless they put in four years in plain clothes. Right. Now, whoever thought of that, I don't know who the genius was, but after grazing for four years and living on a salary that's not, uh, you know, your police salary with these guys with their custom-made suits and hiring yachts on weekends and buying homes all over the country and out of the country. These, some of these guys have homes in Ireland, corrupt cops from SIU, which was the most corrupt narcotics agency that Bob Lucy belonged to. Uh, so this is what the public doesn't know. So getting back to Murphy, he writes in his book, I don't think promoting Serpico was the right thing to do. In fact, it was too right. Well, first of all, the bastard never promoted me because he only gave me third grade, which I was supposed to get after four years in plain clothes. Right. If he would have given me first grade, which so many cops think I got, that would have been a promotion. Right. That did not happen. Now, another guy, Murphy's friend, who his name is James Fife, who... Uh, was the police commissioner in charge of training at the police academy. He writes a book called Above the Law. I would have never heard of this book except my nephew Vincent went to law school at Columbia. And it was Doug required reading in his law class. And it's filled with lies about what happened the night I got shot. Right. Now, why would somebody write this? And I said to my nephew, how could they write something like this? And he says, look at the acknowledgments. I go to the acknowledgments and to the man who did the most to combat police corruption, we dedicate this book to Patrick V. Murphy. Jesus. Now this guy... James Fife, may he be burning in hell because he's a lying bastard. He wrote in his book, and anybody could read it if they want it. I'm not quoting, but I got it pretty much in my head. He's letting the cops off the hook. He says, 
detectives working in uh, Brooklyn South had to make an arrest in Brooklyn North for some reason. And they called up headquarters and asked if there was a Spanish-speaking undercover police officer on duty. And lo and behold, Serpico was the only guy available, which is kind of true because I was the only guy at that time that spoke Spanish other than some other Spanish scop- cops that weren't, you know, maybe they were in uniform or something. Right. But the fact is, uh, he says uh, they never knew Serpico. He had never met them before. And I thought, you lying piece of shit. He says that's why they assigned him to Brooklyn North because it was so far removed from the Bronx where he exposed corruption. Doug, what are we talking about here? Cambodia? Mm-hmm. I had already testified before a grand jury. Murphy knew my ass was, you know, I had a big target on my back. Absolutely. He says in his book, you know, what should I do with this guy Serpico? He's got this in confidential to his to all his chiefs. Uh, uh, he says the media has me on the spot to show I'm bigger than the system and reward him, right? Mm-hmm. And he keeps contradicting himself in the book. He says, yeah, time and again, all his allegations would vanish into thin air. Really? Then how come they formed the NAP Commission over my accusations? Right. So this lying bastard, as I said, holy Catholic roller, may he be burning in hell. And I went and I confronted him at my alma mater, the John Jay College of Christ- of uh, Criminal Justice, of all names, that all these, uh, most of, uh, well, let me say, there might be some good ones, but a lot of these police bosses, they go there and they get their degrees and they all become professors and they keep propagating their bullshit. Right. Because... John Jay College of Criminal Justice still has not recognized me. They will not have me citing an oral history, although they got all the other guys, uh, Michael Armstrong, who was the chief uh, uh, prosecutor from the Knapp Commission. So this is what I want your listeners to understand, how the system of corruption works. It's not the little cop in the street. It's all the way at the top. And it's like an octopus that covers all law enforcement. Now, getting back to the Medal of Honor and the night I got shot, there was a cop on the left and there was a cop on the right. And they said, just get the door open. I told them, you know, uh, I had witnessed the buy because I went up on the top the landing above and I looked over through the landing stairwell, uh, the banister. I saw these two guys approaching and asking and the guy opened the door, had a chain. They made an exchange. Then I went on the roof. I flashed my light telling them the guys coming down were dirty and they grabbed them. There were three cops there, right? Three other cops, narcotics cops. So now they came upstairs. One guy's on the right, on the top of the stairwell. The other guy's on my left. They all have their gun drawn, myself included. We all had chief special, uh, 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 38 special snub nose, five shot revolvers. Right. My nine millimeter was my backup. I was the first cop in New York City to ever carry a 9 millimeter with a 14-round magazine. So now I knock on the door. I tell him I want to make a buy. He opens the door. The chain is there. I hit it with my shoulder, 
and the chain bust. And I stick my arm, my foot over the, uh, the door jam. I got my arm, my shoulder, and my head in the door. And I got my gun pointing at the guy, and I got it cocked. Okay? And I'm waiting. I mean, these guys should have, you know, hit me like friggin' gangbusters. Absolutely. But they're just, they're just standing there. And schmuck o me, you make the mistake no cop should ever make, and that's taking your eye off the perp. But I was so enraged. I talk and I turned. I said, what the f***? You're waiting up and give me a hand. And when I turned back, bang, he shoots me. I return fire. I drop my gun. And I go down. And he's able to pick up my gun and escape out the back window. Okay? Wow. With two cops there. No 1013. Now, no ballistics. They say, there oh, they returned fire. Their guns fired several rounds. Really? How many rounds? How many rounds were recovered? Yeah. Serpico fired one round from his gun. Uh, they fired several. Is that a report? Several rounds? These weren't automatics. The empty shell is still in the, in the cylinder. Uh, where are the holes on the door? What did they shoot at? The guy got away out the back window and left the blood trail. So well, let me interrupt yeah. here for a second so people know. So you shot you shot the suspect, and that's why he was bleeding. You returned fire. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. That's what I got the Medal of Honor for. As I said, they expected me to die, or even if I didn't, that would have you know, cops have gotten the medal for that. All right? Mm -hmm. So now they want to make it look like I got the medal for blowing the whistle. Right. And that's what I'm objecting to, this Siri Nelson, the National Whistleblower Center, this other whistleblowing agency. Why are they doing this? they making it look like the police are rewarding me finally for blowing the whistle. Right. Bullshit. That was my medal. I deserved it for what I did. I did not get it for blowing the whistle. And you would never recognize, Frank, but what, what, you got the Medal of Honor, but you were never recognized or given any type of award from the New York City Police Department for exposing corruption. That's correct, right? Absolutely. And I don't know if any, I don't know. I got, oh, yeah, the, I got a reward, all right? I got a bullet in the face. Right. Because uh, I don't know, reward. has any police officer in New York City ever gotten a, a medal for exposing corruption since you exposed it? Because you didn't get no medal for exposing corruption. You got the Medal of Honor for getting shot in the line of duty, and rightfully so. But uh, as far as huh. I know... There hasn't Doug, been a police officer Doug, in New York City that's got a medal for exposing corruption. Doug, I know what you're saying, but look, uh, for your listeners, okay, I'm glad you, you brought that up. Um, um, Adrian Schoolcraft, okay, mm -hmm. uh, a United States Navy veteran, okay, one of the most decent men and police officers I ever met, okay? I had the honor to meet. He's a cop. He's working in the very same precinct. My first precinct was his first precinct, the 81st precinct in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. although the station house was rebuilt in, uh, after my day, but it was still the 81st precinct. The lieutenant is telling him, to go out and lock up these so-and-sos, right? Mm -hmm. So Adrian starts recording the roll calls, right? And he does the right thing. He tries and say, hey, this is wrong. What they do, he becomes the victim. 
okay? Now they're hammering the shit out of him. They're driving him crazy, okay? So he's sick, and he can't take anymore, and he says, I got to go home. I'm sick, right? And he goes home, and he's lying in bed. Now this guy is no Dumbo. He's sharp, and he's a patrolman. Right. He wires his room, not with one, but with two tape recorders, because he knew damn well what was going to happen. Right. By the way, people want to know, always asking about this guy, Dirk, and why I don't really appreciate and respect him. Adrian's father got in touch with David Dirk, who's supposed to be my partner, who he never was my partner. Uh, he did go with me to the New York Times and testified before the Knapp Commission and went out of the room crying. Uh, Adrian's father, Larry, calls uh, Dirk, mm -hmm. who's now retired, a retired police lieutenant. What do you think Dirk does? He calls, he rats Adrian out to internal affairs. Oh, wow. Now his ass is on the line. So I hear about it. I get in touch with Adrian. And at first, I mean, Adrian sent me an email. It was so overwhelming. I thought he was kidding me. I thought he was ridiculing me, but he was so sincere. He said, wow, it's the real Frank Serpico, you know, he was so, and, you know, so I start um, um, supporting him and coaching him, right? Because then he had New York Civil Liberties Union on his side. I worked with them. I worked with Adrian. I supported him when he was living upstate New York, and they would send cops all the way up to New York State to torment them outside his door. But I jump ahead. So now an inspector with a bunch of cops go to his door and they say, open up. And he says, leave me alone. I'm not feeling good. I got high blood pressure. I, I don't feel good. So they, uh, I forget how they got into his door, but he didn't let them in. I don't know if they broke in or got the key. And then they handcuff him behind his back. They find his tape recorder, and they bring him to the friggin' psycho ward. They psycho him. Six days he's handcuffed to a gurney. And he says, Frank, I'm in the friggin' psycho ward with a guy next to me combing his hair with his own excrement. Can you imagine what this does to a decent cop? You know, let Frank, that's, you let me say something because I want, people, I want people to understand something. This, the Adrian Schoolcraft story is just what Frank said. It, it's unbelievable. The New York City Police Department came into his home and committed him to a psych ward. If this is this happened, folks. You can go back online and reach it. We're not going to go into the whole story, but that, that's what happened. Frank, one more thing so people understand. What was the reason that Adrian School, Schoolcraft first started recording? What is it that they wanted the patrol officers to do that he disagreed with? They wanted him to go and stop every black Hispanic uh, within a certain age. Um, it was so ridiculous that uh, one lieutenant said to one guy, give that guy a ticket. And he said, what for? He said, for unleashed dogs. And the officer said that the guy doesn't have a dog, Lou. He says, are you going to give him a ticket or should I cite you for disobeying? Jesus. Okay. Okay. So now, um, getting back to Adrian, um, if he didn't have, can you hear me? I hear you fine. Okay. If Adrian didn't have a second recorder in his room that he recorded this whole episode 
of the inspector going in there and committing him, we never would have heard of it. You would have said, I, cops were saying, come on, they wouldn't do that to another cop. You see, Doug? Mm -hmm. People don't want to believe it. Cops don't want to believe it. Good cops don't want to believe how corrupt the system is because they haven't been exposed to it. Right. So, anyway, um, uh, anyway, anything else we want to keep it short? We don't want to bore you, <clears throat> your listeners. We could, you know, take it up another time if you like. But basically, clarifying this uh, misrepresentation of uh, what I got the medal for. You know, they all want to get on the uh, on the wagon like, uh, you know, they're changing the system. Right. But uh, and uh, now that's the reason why I talked to you. Um, you know, you've been on the podcast before, and I always get a lot of good reviews when you're on. But you know, when the when you got the uh, you received February third when you got the Medal of Honor uh, and the certificate, the certified certificate in the mail, and then this broke in the news. You know, a lot of the news did the correct reporting, but there's a lot uh, that didn't. And even with organizations that are are saying that the reason why you got the Medal of Honor after 50 years it was because of your whistleblowing because you exposed corruption and that's that is farthest from the truth uh, you got like I said earlier you received the Medal of Honor 50 years ago uh, because you got shot in the line of duty you almost died you got shot in the head you got shot in the face but now they're turning that around saying finally the police acknowledge whistleblower Frank Serpico who exposed corruption and I want people to understand that that is not the case there is no police officer, yep. and I've done research, that I can find. If there is somebody out there, uh, you can contact me, Truth and Consequences, WDP at gmail.com. There is no New York City police officer that I found in the history of the NYPD who has been given an award for exposing corruption. Uh, if I'm incorrect and in that, go ahead. I want to I wanna correct something else, which I've done before, but just in case, because the movie did me also a great disservice right because i don't know why if uh, it was pacino's idea or uh lumet the director pacino pretends he's got this nine millimeter in his hand mm -hmm. and he can't get it in the door and his hand is getting scratched where the hell did they get that from because then cops say oh yeah that's not the way it happened and the the other cops shot him and uh, uh so now I want to say this in closing, uh, because these whistleblowing agencies and and these uh, newspapers that are getting on the on the wagon that this is being picked up all over the world, Doug. Okay, mm -hmm. now they're doing a gross disservice because yes, whistleblowers deserve to be recognized, but that is not what happened here and the national whistleblower center put this article out and saying yeah we just should be called well yeah frank uh, they shouldn't spin it that way as if something had been achieved the statement must have been written this way on purpose the only alternative hypothesis is that miss nelson the executive uh, uh, who who runs the organization uh, simply is not competent, or uh, is uh, either option. It's problematic for the whistleblower movement. Right. May I ask? Yes, he did the right thing. He righted a wrong important as this was it should not be treated as some kind of victory lap for whistleblowers they are worlds apart period okay very well said um ladies and gentlemen um that was uh retired 
legendary NYPD detective uh, Frank Serpico. He was the first police officer in American history to come out and expose widespread police corruption in a police department. And his police department at the time, 50 years ago, was the New York City Police Department. Uh, I want to thank you, Frank, and um, we'll, we'll talk again. Uh, very well said. Thank you, Doug, for getting uh, help me getting this record straight because all these newspapers do is they edit it, uh, you know, for their sound bites and all they they care about is, uh, you know, they don't care about the truth. Thanks. Okay, Frank, good night. Thanks for listening, folks. And remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel of Truth and Consequences with Doug Papa by hitting the red subscribe button. Audio podcast of all episodes are also available on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Radio Public, and other platforms. Support my independent investigative journalism if you can at paypal.me backslash duckpapa. On my next episode, you will hear from a retired NYPD internal affairs detective whose comments mirror comments made by Las Vegas Metro police officers who have spoken to me over the years. We must create an atmosphere in which the dishonest officer fears the honest one and not the other way around. I hope that this investigation and any future ones will deal with corruption at all levels within the department and not limit themselves to cases involving individual patrolmen. I hope that police officers in the future will not experience the same frustration and anxiety that I was subjected to for the past five years at the hands of my superiors because of my attempt to report corruption.